but especially today, Lord, how we can come together and worship you. Lord, I pray right now before uh, what happened before service or what's taking place after service, we just kind of forget about that. And we focus, we focus on an empty tomb, which communicates to us that you are our risen Savior. And Lord, I pray that our worship is just beautiful to you today. In your name, amen. Just get excited, so excited that that tomb was empty. That we get to get together and worship as a body of believers every year and remember the sacrifice that Christ paid for us. If you're new here for the first time, we'd like to say welcome. Thank you for joining us here at Glen Meadows. We are so excited you're here. Uh, what we have coming up so that you can learn a little more about Glen Meadows is next Sunday following the third service. Right behind me in the fellowship hall, uh, we will have lunch with you, uh, whoever wants to come, and it's going to be uh, brisket, and it's good lunch, our cooks are the best, and Pastor Mac will be addressing and, and telling you a little bit about the vision of Glen Meadows, what we're all about, and how you can get connected. So if you're new here, thanks for joining us. We hope today is just a wonderful day that you just, just absolutely feel like you're part of our family, and we hope to get to know you a little more. Also, if you are one of our great younger generation kids or young adults, we want to let you know that camps and VBS are on the way. So if you want to get connected into camp or you want to be a part of camp, you can register online. we got Falls Creek for our teenagers. That's the best camp ever. We love it. We don't miss it even as adults. We go to serve because we have such a great time watching our younger generation as they connect with the Lord. Camps are important for that. They, they help our younger generation make decisions for Christ, but also gets them reset so that they can continue to go through the school year. You don't want your younger generation to miss on that. Also, with our kids' ministry, the two things, they got camp at Camp Zephyr coming up. And then also on your way out, we have uh, these VBS magnets. If you've been to VBS, you know this. If you're an adult, you only need to know one thing, earplugs. That's it. If you have earplugs, VBS is fantastic. If you're a kid, you don't need earplugs because you're making the noise. But we have a great time. Uh, take a look around. There's more kids in the auditorium for VBS that are in the auditorium right now. It's fantastic. And if you know, if you've got uh, nieces, nephews, grandkids, kids, friends, neighbors, let them know about VBS. You can go online and register for that, and it'll be a blast. We have a great time. If you want to volunteer, also, you can go online and click off the box and volunteer. We can use all the adult support we can get. Anyways, those are the things that are coming up. There's much, much more you can find out online, but that's irrelevant to right now. Because right now is our opportunity to get excited about worshiping our risen Savior today. So, happy Easter. Let's worship together. All right, give Jim a hand. All right, let's stand together. Let's join our voices together and sing unto the Lord.
guessing this with me. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. You guys sound great. I'll tell you what, after all this COVID mess, to hear all you guys together singing, it sounds wonderful. It sounds so good. It's good to be back together like this. Let's go to the scripture this morning. We're in Luke 24, verse one. It says this, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took their spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. This is the word of the Lord. That's a very powerful statement. The gospel rests on that statement. For he is not here, he is risen. Let's bow our heads this morning as we reflect upon this passage. Prepare our hearts today to seek the face of the Lord. Lord, as we come before you this morning, we are so very grateful 
grateful for the gospel. Lord. Great, grateful, Lord, for the resurrection. Grateful, Lord, that you have saved us, that we are redeemed, that we have been made new, that we have eternal life. Lord, all those things we are mindful of this morning. And as we sing this morning, we sing as those who have been forgiven. We sing as those who have been redeemed. And not with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but by your precious blood, Lord Jesus. It's good to be together this morning in your name alone. And as we sing, our heart's desire is to glorify you. Be honored today, Lord, with our singing, with the position, Lord, of our hearts, the position of our minds. And it's in your name, Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's continue to sing. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night voice Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? But I could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory.
pray together. Father, thank you for an opportunity just to worship our risen Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you would speak to every heart. Lord, that as we read the Bible, you would be speaking to our ears and driving it home to our hearts. And Lord, we too, all, everyone here listening, would experience the resurrection power that Jesus offers. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time together. We pray for your healing touch on bodies. We pray for your healing touch on souls. Lord, we pr pray for your healing touch on relationships. And Lord, that for all of us would experience the benefits of the resurrection. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have a Bible, turn to the book of John. If you don't have one, there should be in the chair in front of you. And if you want that Bible, you can take it home. And it's, it's our gift to you. If you like your neighbor's Bible, take theirs home, and it's their gift to you. It'll be good. You'll like that. We'll find out who's a Christian and who's not. <laughs> Amen. Hey, turn John chapter 20. We'll be in verse 1. We're going to be looking at this amazing story. How we end up in verse 1 of chapter 20 is we know in chapter 2, it's the very first miracle of Jesus. And Jesus is authenticating who he is, that he has a right to speak on the behalf of God, Having been followed by signs and miracles and wonders, chapter 2, he turns the water into wine. Chapter 4, he heals the officer's son. Chapter 5, he cures the paralytic. He begins to walk. Uh, chapter 6, he feeds the 5,000. He takes five loaves and two little fish, and he multiplies it to where 5,000 people uh, are, uh, are fed. Then he walks on the water in the midst of the storm. And he silences the water. Um, that is uh, the fifth miracle. And then he gives sight to the blind, blind Bartimaeus and Jericho. He gives sight to the blind. Remember, blind Bartimaeus says, uh, uh, son of David, son of David, heal me. And he catches his attention and Jesus heals him. And then we have the seventh sign, which is the healing of the resurrection of Lazarus. So the book of John is centered around seven signs as the movement. You know, you got the book of Mark, there's seven signs in two chapters. I mean, Mark is immediate, and lots of healings, lots of signs, lots of miracles taking place. But John, just seven, through the long book, and he's stating a case and making a case. Seven is a number of perfection, right? But eight is a number of new beginnings, and that's where we have the eighth sign, and that is the resurrection, because the resurrection gives everybody a brand new beginning. And as we look at this passage in verse one, it has... In fact, it's a beautiful the way all these stories that are developed in the book of John are mingled together in an unbelievable fabric that paints a picture of the love of God. You've got Peter, who has a foot-shaped mouth, right? You've got John, who's a very young man. He's probably a young teenager as a disciple of Jesus. And you've got the women. You've got particularly represented here by Mary Magdalene, and we'll go into detail about her life. You've got... Uh, Caiaphas and all these, all these stories coming together and centered around this very point as it starts in verse 1 where it says, on the first day of the week, every one of the gospels refers to the resurrection to taking place on the first day of the week. That is the reason why we don't worship on the traditional Sabbath being Saturday, Friday night to Saturday night, but we do on Sunday because it's the first day of the week. And we see that observation in the book of Acts they can, because it's the day the Lord rose from the dead. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. The other disciple is John. He refers to himself in a humble way of just saying the other disciple. Um, the one that Jesus loved and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out, headed to the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. So John wants you to know he can run faster than Peter, <laughs> just the way it goes. And so stooping down, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Then following him, Simon Peter also came, and he entered the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head 
was not lying with the linen cloth, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. So here's the scene. If you've, if you've ever seen one of these things or ever gone to Israel, you can see these tombs. You can even walk into them. They're hewn out, small cave on the side of a hill, and you can go inside, and inside there'll be a room, and that's probably where they kept the spices to uh, anoint the body with these spices and just to do what the anointings do, the, the spices do to bodies, keep them smelling good. And there's a shelf. It's kind of like a bench, a sepulcher, if you will. And you would lay a body there and put the spices, mummy them up, just wrap them, put the linen on them. And in some tombs that are very wealthy, you might have other rooms or other benches, and you could have several, several bodies there. And the reason they did that is to allow the flesh to decay off of the bones, and they take the bones, put it in a bone box, and there you have it to do whatever you want. You, want it. you just take it with you. So that's what they would do. And there are many people that say, and they're critics, that the resurrection didn't take place. They will say that when Jesus died on the cross, that he didn't really die. In fact, Muslims say that. Jesus didn't die. They got the wrong guy. There's other people that say, well, no one can raise from the dead because that's impossible. Therefore, Jesus couldn't have really died. But after two days of trials, beatings, floggings to where they ripped the flesh off of his back, um, thorns on his head, nails in his hands, in his feet, a crown of thorns on his head, suffocating on the cross for hours, and then eventually a Roman soldier ramming a spear under his ribcage up into his heart, breaking that water sack, and for somebody to say he didn't die, and then staying in a dark, dank, cold cave for three days, and he didn't die. No, he was dead. In fact, he was so dead that when the Roman soldiers were taking the live guys, criminals, malefactors, off the cross, they broke their leg, but when they came to Jesus, because they didn't want him to run away, they came to Jesus and said, no, he's already dead. Roman soldiers, who were professional executioners, said, this dude is dead. Went into the tomb. Another reason we know that he was absolutely dead, not only because he said he was going to die, but because when they looked inside, they saw the wrappings of the cloth. So one theory of the missing body of Jesus is that somebody stole him to propagate the message of Jesus. But how many people go inside a tomb like that, go to a mummified body and unwrap them and then take the body and leave the linen? That's why it's mentioned several times. No, the linen was still there. It's because you don't want to unwrap a body that's just icky. <laughs> Who wants to do that and just take a, a body without its wrappings? So the it was all left there intact as though the body just went through the linen and had a complete resurrection. So that's why the linen is mentioned in detail that he was there. So Peter and the other disciple looked inside, saw the wrappings, saw the folded of the face cover. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first, that's John, then also went in and saw and believed. Think about that. This disciple had the full teachings of Jesus, goes inside, leans down, goes inside, sees the wrapping and goes, that's all I need to see. I believe. Let me ask you something. What does it take for you to be a believer and follower of Jesus? Now, many of you, if not all of you, you've already made that decision. And those that are watching are watching later. So, man, I've given my life to Christ. I believe without a shadow of a doubt. Easter Sunday is the highlight, the greatest holiday of the whole year. That is when we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, proven who He is. But then others may say, I'm not there yet. I'm, I haven't believed. I'm not believing. But I think the burden of proof on the resurrection lies with those who are critical towards it or don't believe it instead of on those that accept it. It's kind of like today we had a um, a sunrise service out on the new property. How many of you were at the sunrise service at the new property? All right. Thanks for coming. Uh, <laughs> that's really good. We had, we had like 400 plus over there. And then last service we had a bunch and this service a bunch. And, and over, over there, um, we had everything planned. We had all the chairs set out. We had lots of cool burritos. We had coffee. We had everything planned, except we forgot to plan for the sun to, sh to be seen. We didn't plan that. I mean, there were clouds. And so for somebody to come up to me and say, you know what? I don't believe the sun rose today. And I'm like, dude, it had to rise. 
I mean, if the sun didn't rise, this place would be black. This place would be freezing right now. You know what? Why don't you prove that it didn't rise? Because we all know it did. It's very similar to the resurrection. You prove, you produce his body. Don't you think Caiaphas, the Romans, don't you think Herod, don't you think Pontius Pilate, don't you think all these guys who hated Jesus, don't you think they would love to have tried to produce a body, but they couldn't produce a body? The burden's on them. The fact of the matter is, the resurrection is so powerful in the way that it changed lives in a matter of decades, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people were followers of Jesus who everybody else said was dead. For instance, take the disciples. After the crucifixion, the disciples went and hid. In fact, right before then, the number of disciples had greatly dwindled because of the pressure and the persecution. And they're like, you know what? It's just not worth it. I don't want, I don't want to stick my neck out for that. And they all went and hid. And after the crucifixion, they all were hunkered down in one little house and they were hiding because they knew they were next. In fact, there was one guy named Thomas. We call him, unfortunately, we call him Doubting Thomas. But he was in there amongst the disciples, and he heard that he had risen from the dead. And Thomas says, I'm not going to believe if I can't put my hand in his wounds and know that he's alive and see him face to face. And just right after this scene in the same chapter, Jesus comes into the room where the disciples are, and he goes over to Thomas, and he says, you want to feel this? Because I heard you were doubting me. And those disciples went out of that room, and they changed the world. They shared with somebody about Jesus who shared with somebody about Jesus who talked about the resurrection and discipled them, who discipled them, who eventually told me about Jesus. Now I'm telling you about Jesus, that he's alive and he's well. And that's exactly what happened. He's alive. Do you know that? He's alive. So when it says that John went in and he saw and he believed, there's always something that captures your attention. And we'll look at that in just a second. So as a, John continues to write, um, for they were doubting, but they did not believe because they didn't understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. So the two disciples go back to where the other disciples are, and it leaves Mary Magdalene. Now, there are those that accuse Christianity of being Neanderthal, of being misogynistic, or keeping women or other people down, and nothing could be farther from the truth. Wherever Christianity has spread, so has freedom for all races, for all people groups, against tyranny and against oppression in every single place. 2,000 years ago, when it was very, very unlikely and not proper to highlight women, the Bible does all through the pages, all through the pages. And here is one of them. The witness, the first witness to the resurrection was Mary Magdalene. In fact, she was there when they captured Jesus. She was there when they were trying Jesus. She was there when they were crucifying Jesus. She was there when they took his body off the cross. And she was there every single morning until the first morning of the week when she actually spoke face to face with Jesus. And here's the conversation. The conversation is very clear. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look in the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying. One at the head of the bench, one at the foot of, of the bench. And they said to her, the angel said to her, woman, why are you crying? Now, that word crying is used six times in the Gospel of John. It's used four times here to describe Mary of Magdalene. Why are you crying? Well, do, you know, do you know Mary's story, Mary Magdalene? She was not a good lady. To say she was a woman of ill repute is saying it very nicely. She was, she was bad. In fact, she was so bad that when Jesus met her, she didn't just have one demon. She had seven demons. Have you ever met a woman with seven demons? Never mind that question. <laughs> it can get really bad. It can get really bad. Did you know demons are real? Did you know that the supernatural life is real? Did you know that there's more to this world in what you don't see than what you do see? But it seems that we all are focused on what we do see. We are 
motivated by our money. We're motivated by our looks. We're motivated by our reputation. But there's a whole other world that is so much more important than the things you and I see, and it is the spiritual realm. And there are demons. And demons aren't ultimately powerful. They're not. God is ultimately powerful, but they are more powerful than you are. And just like Mary Magdalene, you have no recourse to the demonic world. You can't fight them. You can't battle them. You can't outthink them. They are stronger, mightier. I mean, they could jump a a building in a single bounce. They just can. You may say, you know what? I've got some holy water. That holy water don't work like you think it does. You may say, you know what? I'll just put some garlic on. Well, you know what? You won't get rid of a demon, but you'll get rid of a lot of friends. (laughs) How about a silver bullet? Only works on werewolves right? Only works on werewolves. How do you deal with the demonic force? How do we deal with the demonic force all around us? Let me ask you something. Let me be really blunt with you. When is the last time you acknowledge the fact that you were being tempted by the dark world? Acknowledge it. And just, if you haven't, if you haven't acknowledged it, that you're being tempted, drawn, oppressed, coming up against the dark world, then let me tell you very kindly, you're blind. And you have your head in the sand. Because the enemy is all around. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it more than abundant. So just to go through life thinking about the things we see and feel, we think that's great. There is a whole battle going on that you and I need to be aware of. Magdalene, Mary Magdalene knew this very well. And when she met Jesus and they locked eyes and he said, Mary, and he said, demons come out, they left. Jesus is the one who controls the demon forces when you surrender to him. He is more powerful, but without the Lord, eh, you can put your heads back in the sand and try to make it as you make it and try to go as you go and hope that when you die, you get the most toys because obviously somebody's keeping score because it seems like that's all anybody wants to do is have the most amount of toys and the most amount of reputation. And I'm telling you this, and you've heard it before, I've done lots of funerals and I've never seen a U-Haul following a hearst. Never. It just doesn't happen. So the most important things are the things you can't really see all the time. There are demons. But also there's angels. Mary, she looks inside and she sees these angels, one at the foot of the, of the slab and one at the, the head of the slab. And every single account in the Gospels, this, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they talk about angels. In Matthew, the angel had rolled away the stone and is sitting on top. And he's like, I'm the one that rolled the stone. That was pretty simple. There's another one that was outside next to Jesus, in, I think in Mark. And two of them there. In fact, there were probably angels all over that area in that garden tomb location telling us that humanity doesn't control this territory anymore. God is in control of it. And in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God is honored, God is glorified, and the angels are just going, oh, I mean, just phenomenal moment. And that's what happened. And angels are here just as much as demons. Angels are powerful. One angel in the Old Testament was in battle and knocked out 25,000 people with the flip of a wing. I made that part up, but he did kill 25,000 people, and I'm sure it was a flip of something, and they're just dead, just dead. Angels are real. The supernatural world is real, and all around us. But what's most important here is this incredible questions that Mary Magdalene receives. Look at this first question. Why are you crying? Look at that, verse 15. Woman, why are you crying? That's what Jesus says. He said to her, why are you crying? Who is it that you're seeking? Now think about this for a moment. Mary Magdalene had her whole life changed and her whole future changed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And she she is fixed on Jesus, Savior, Lord, Master, and healed her life. And he says, why are you crying? Now we can imagine why she's crying. She's really depressed, to say the least. Her heart is crushed. Her heart is broken. But the problem is she didn't know the whole truth, right? She didn't know what was really behind the scenes. She was crying because she only saw part of the story. She wasn't celebrating because, like with Jesus, because he knew the full story. Kind of like when we're worshiping outside and you can't see the sun, but the sun's still there. Just because there's clouds doesn't mean the sun isn't there, right? Just because your heart is hurting 
Just because there's relationship issues, just because there's financial issues or bad diagnosis doesn't mean God's not on his throne. And so Jesus says, and why are you crying? Think of that contrast for a moment. She's thinking one way, which leads to tears. But if she was thinking with all the facts, if she was thinking with clarity, scripturally, if she was thinking the mind of God, then she wouldn't have been crying, would she? I wonder that about myself. When things are hard, when things are bad or a bad diagnosis or a bad situation, and I'm feeling downtrodden, I'm feeling downcast, I'm feeling depressed, and I'll think about this and I'll say, could it be I'm feeling this way because I don't know the whole story? Listen, let me, t- let me say something very clear. In your life, the story's not over yet. God is still working. God is still God. Jesus has risen from the dead. And ultimately, as a believer, he is going to welcome you into his kingdom and say, well done, good and faithful servant. And the resurrection reminds us that Jesus always asks us, why are we crying? Who is it that you're seeking? I mean, who is it? Jesus even asked some people, what is it that you're seeking? He's asking her, who are you seeking? Are you seeking a dead Jesus or a former teacher, a former rabbi, something that happened a long time ago? Or are you in touch with the resurrected, present tense, alive, Lord God Almighty? Let me ask you this question. Let me ask you. Are we in touch mentally, emotionally, soulishly in touch with the alive, all-powerful one who saved you from your sins? Are you in touch with him? Who is it that you're seeking? Supposing, here's what she says, her answer, she, doesn't, she still doesn't know who he is. Supposing he was a gardener, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will take him away. I'll take care of him. And Jesus said, this is powerful. Jesus said to her, Mary. He didn't read her any scripture. He's already done that. He didn't try to convince her of anything else. She already knew who he was. She just needs to know who he is. Do you see the difference? Unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians that know who Jesus was, but they don't know who Jesus is. Does that make sense to you? That that you have a current, vibrant walk with the Lord Jesus Christ because he's alive and he cares and he calls you like he does her by name. And right when he called her by name, look at the response. He says, Mary, turning around, she said to him in Aramaic, Rabbi, Rabboni, Rabbi, teacher. And Apparently, she falls to her knees, grabs him by his ankles. And then verse 17, he says, listen, don't cling to me. In other words, I'm not going to be here long. Don't don't cling to me. Since I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them that I'm ascending to the Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. Let me tell you something. When the Lord calls your name, and here, let me tell you what that's like. I've never heard the Lord, Lord's, Lord, the Lord's verse, I've never heard the Lord's voice verbally, but I've heard him talk to me daily. And that's when you pick up the Bible, you, you look at circumstances, that still small voice, and I know many, if not all of you have experienced that, and when you're reading, it's like the spirit begins to thump on your chest and says, Listen, listen, and you get a clear message from the Bible that the Lord is talking to you, and then you respond. You, it, hearing the word of God without a proper response leads to a decay in your life. <laughs> Impression without expression leads to what? Depression. So when the Lord moves in your life and is speaking to you, you and I must respond as Mary Magdalene did. And it might be, you might be in a, in, a, in a situation in your life to where you're cold towards God or you're no longer hearing his voice or you're no longer feeling the prompting of the spirit and it's because you haven't responded to the last thing he has told you. 
And that's why it's very important to daily be in the Word of God and say, God, search me and try me and see if there be any wayward way, wicked way in my life, and I follow him. And the Lord begins to move, but you must respond. Sometimes it's too late to respond. Did you know that? I read an article yesterday about a man in Canada. He played the lotto. It was at, it was at 8.59 with seven seconds left for the deadline. And right when he paid for that lotto ticket, he was in time. But, and, and you know what he won? Tw half of $27 million. Now, that's, that's a lot of money, right? $27 million. The only problem is, by the time he bought the ticket and the ticket printed and got a time stamp, it was eight seconds too late. 9.07 it was printed. He appealed. Supreme Court of Canada said, too bad, too late. Nothing we can do. Did you know it's too late for some people? There comes a time. There comes a moment to where it's too late. I remember in college we were going to uh, take a trip and do a, a revival type thing in Florida. And I remember driving from Oklahoma to get back to Dallas during spring break uh, to, to go on this trip. And I, I spent a little too much time at my house. I spent too much time at the film station getting candy. And when I, when I got to the place that we were all supposed to meet, the bus had already left. I missed my trip completely. Well, I missed a bus. I finally caught up the next day. Sometimes it's too late. Is it too late for you spiritually? It is if you die. If you don't want to follow the Lord today, don't die. Because it's too late. Hebrew says this. It's appointed unto man to die once. There's no do-overs. Do there's no reincarnation. The Bible's very clear about that. There's no hanging around like a ghost and then haunting people. No, that doesn't happen. The Bible's clear about that. It says, it's appointed unto man to die once, then comes judgment. The evaluation from the Lord. And so there is a time when there is no more time. But the Bible says about time, today is the day of salvation. This, right now, is the time to turn to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you say, you know, I've never thought about that. How do I do it? A young boy asked a preacher one time, says, look, what do I do to get saved? And the preacher said, it's too late. He said, what do you mean? It's too late. No, what do I do? He said, it's too late. He said, well, I can't be too late. I'm still alive. He said, no, it's too late for you to do anything because Jesus has already done it. He's paid for all the sins on the cross. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he took your penalty and my penalty. He took our judgment that whosoever believes in his name would not perish but have everlasting life. But too often, we focus on our past and we focus on our sins. You all know uh, President Garfield? Or, let me say it this way, did you read about President Garfield? I'm sure you didn't know him. Garfield was a brilliant man. He actually was, I'm told, he was president of his denomination's Bible college. They said he was appendextrous to where he could write with his left hand in Greek and his right hand in, in, in Latin at the same time. Very smart man. He was shot, and you all know that. He was shot, and he died. But right after he was shot, uh, 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 someone attending him, a physician, tried to dig the bullet out with his finger and couldn't get it. Then he tried some tweezers and couldn't get it. They took him to Washington, and he made the trip, even though he was weak, and they were trying to find some way to remove the bullet. They actually called Alexander Graham Bell, I mean, he was a little busy. He was working on the phone, but he took time off anyway, and he went to his side, and he had a silver-tipped instrument and tried to get the bullet, couldn't get it, and he died. Do you know what he died of? He died of infection, not the bullet, because they kept digging it around, trying to get it with unclean instruments and unclean fingers and hands, and that's just like many Christians. We're always poking at our sin. We're always looking at our sin. We're always nursing our sin. And it's the sin and the affection that eventually will get us. And the reality is, Jesus already died for our sins. Every sin you have committed can be wiped away because of the power of the blood of Jesus. When he says, you've been freed and you are forgiven, you are forgiven indeed. And that's exactly what happened to Mary Magdalene. And Jesus, right here, when he tells Mary Magdalene to go to the other disciples and tell them what you've seen, he concludes with this. He says, I'm going to my father and your father, to my God and your God. 
See, that's the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. To seek and to save that which is lost. People like you and me. And to reconcile us to the Father so that we can have eternal life. In that one statement, Jesus summarized the completion of his ministry on earth in saying this. Tell them that I'm going to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Can you say that today? Can you say without a shadow of doubt that I know that when I die, I will be with the Lord forever and ever and ever? Can you say that? When I die, I know I'm going to heaven. I know that I know that I know that I've received Christ as Lord and Savior. I know that I know that I know that I've been born again. Can you say that? Have you experienced the drawing of the Lord, the conviction? If you have a desire to know the Lord, then that shows that the Lord desires you. If you desire to know the Lord and you want to have eternal life, you can have it and it can be granted to you right now where you're at. You just simply pray a prayer. You just confess that you, like me, and everybody else, we are sinners. There's no one in this room better than anybody else. You got that? We all fall short of the glory of God. And that's why Jesus came, to reconcile you to God by doing away with your sin, the penalty, and by giving you righteousness, by making you a child of God. And you receive that by faith. You, you trust that he paid the price, not you. That he is the one that earns your way to heaven. Nothing you can do. And by faith, you just simply pray a prayer like this. Just, just pray this. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I know that I've sinned. I've rebelled against you. Lord, forgive me of my sins. And Lord, thank you for coming into my life. And I will follow you all the days of my life. If you mean that, and you pray that, there is no way the Lord won't save you. Paul says in the book of Romans, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's done it all. You can have eternal life. Christian, you know where you're going. You know you have eternal life. I pray that you take this resurrection message and that it burns in your heart to the point that you're willing to share it with every single person you know because there's going to come a point that it's too late for them. But it's not too late now. Now is the time. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you and thank you for your goodness, for your presence even in this room, for the way in which you dwell in every single heart. And Lord, I just pray that you would listen to everyone as they talk to you. Right where you are, in this time of silence, would you just receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? if you haven't already. If you're unsure about eternity, why don't you get that right, right now? And just simply pray a prayer silently as I pray it aloud. Just pray this, Lord Jesus, I know that I have sinned and that I deserve judgment. But thank you for dying on the cross for me. Lord, when I didn't deserve it, you loved me. Come in my heart and make me new. Lord, fill me with your spirit. Lord, I want to be like you. Now make sure you say this when you pray. Say, Lord, thank you for saving me. <clears throat> Amen. Lord, we just pray that you would receive our worship. Lord, I just pray that you would do a great work within our life. And Lord, I just pray that you allow us to just celebrate your powerful resurrection. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer to receive Christ, would you tell me, would you tell one of our deacons, one of our workers, connection team, just tell someone, say, hey, I prayed that prayer with Brother Mac. And we would like to get with you and help you a little farther in your walk with God. We don't want to just see you become a Christian and leave you alone. We want to walk with you. We have a new members class next Sunday called Starting Point. It's right after the third service. We'll feed you lunch, go online, sign up, and you will be blessed. But right now, let's all stand together and let's worship the Lord.
God sent his son. Have a good week. You are dismissed.